From the Twin Cities PBS archives, a conversation with Miles Lord, originally broadcast in 1992. As a federal judge, he made a career of battling corporate goliaths with such cases as reserve mining and the Dalcon Shield. Now his private practice gets attention for its folksy advertising and pro bono work. Our guest is Miles Lord. Let's talk about your growing up. If what I ever did. If you ever did. <laughs> Who was Miles Lord the child, the little boy? I'll tell you a very interesting story about that that might be interesting to you. My brother had his 50th wedding last summer, and Miss Snowbeck, my kindergarten teacher, who has since died, came to that. She said, Miles, I came here intentionally to tell you something. I said, what was that? She said, when I was a kindergarten teacher, there'd be a, two kids would be in a fight. She said, there was another little boy to always go over there and settle a fight. He didn't want to see anybody fight. And that was you. And I, I had that little deal. The bigger boys gave me a little star to be a policeman. They pinned it on me and gave me a little billy club. And I, I, uh, and all the kids walked by my house, even before I went to school. And I was a policeman, and nobody could be bad. And um, I kind of always hated bullies. I interceded on behalf of the younger kids and stopped that kind of thing. And I, I remember that. It, it lasted quite a ways into my life, like maybe up to now. And. Uh, I think if there's anything that that I sort of part of my psyche is a desire to see people treated fairly. But where did you get those values from? Well, we were not rich. We were quite poor. I saw favoritism in the schools. You know, I can understand how a black kid or an Indian kid could get pretty hostile about that. I never did get hostile about it. But uh, on the other hand, my brothers helped to organize the United Steel Workers. They were a little older than me in the mines. Uh, I know something of what people went through when the immigrants who from Croatia and Yugoslavia came over. Were your grandparents immigrants? No. My family's been here since some of them were Tories, would you believe that? And fled to Canada to avoid those radicals that were fighting for the American Revolution. But um, life wasn't easy for our family. There were nine kids. My dad wasn't well. He could not work very much. So, what did he do? Well, he was, uh, originally he at the age of about 12, he started working in the lumber camps in the wintertime and float down the river to Minneapolis on the logs and work. At 36, he met my mother and stayed up in the woods there. They settled on some beautiful land which had about that much black dirt on top of it. And they never made a living. So when we moved to Crosby, which was only about eight miles away, and worked in the mines and so forth. Who was more influential? My mother. My mother was very influential with me. And one of my older brothers. My mother was a peacemaker, and my older brother was very aggressive. And between the two of them, I came out with a little of both. But uh, one of the things I love now, I really treasure. See, long before you and I got on this television show, maybe 40 years ago, I was busy prosecuting the criminals that Hubert Humphrey had um, dug up and trying to clean up Minneapolis. And I was so frightened, I'd frightened people so much if I call a crook up, I called three of them up and they jumped out the window. All the way, you know, they killed themselves just from a phone call. I have to be very, I used to have to be very careful, say this is Miles Lord, it's nothing wrong, it's just take it easy and all you know, but um, the people from those days remember. In those days, they had fewer television sets. They didn't have cable. Uh, they, 
they had a newspaper that wasn't afraid to print my name like they are now. The Minneapolis paper won't put my name in, in any story. Why? I don't know. There's one editor that doesn't like me there, and he cuts my name out of every, every story. So tell me, which cases have been most important to you as you look back at your career on the bench? Well, Beth, as a woman, you know the most important case I ever decided is the one that gave uh, required that high schools uh, spend the same amount of money on girls' athletic activities as they did on boys. And my own grandchildren have benefited from that. Do you really think that that's the most important case? I think that that's the case that had the most immediate impact and the one that uh, people, if they think about it, what it was just 19 years ago and what the young women have been able to do since then, it had a tremendous impact. But the reserve mining case, the ecologists tell me that it alerted the world to the dangers of industrial pollution. I suppose in the long run, that would be the most important one because it will ultimately maybe contribute substantially towards saving the earth. Tell me about that trial. Well, it was a charades. This is in 1973, right? About then. I had it for seven years, I believe. I had to take it because the judge who had it, no one but he and I knew it, but he was dying of leukemia. So I took the case. I tried to get somebody else to take it because I knew I would end up in the soup <laughs> if I took the case. How'd you know that? Well, because they had judges on the Court of Appeals who were very favorably disposed toward the mining companies and toward any kind of business. And the question involved here in the case was? The question was whether or not this company should continue to put asbestos-like material into Lake Superior and, more importantly, into the air. They're still putting it in the air up on the Iron Range. I read some statistics that say 37% of the adults in the Iron Range area have pleural placking in their lungs from these tiny uh, sub-microscopic particles entering into their lungs. But maybe I'm wrong about that. But I, it did alert the world to the dangers of asbestos. But you said you thought you knew you were going to be in the soup, as right. you are saying, right. on this one. Right. So did you feel a sense of... Uh, you could do anything since you... I thought I'd do about what I wanted to because I knew that in the end the mining company would win, but they'd have to climb over me first. So tell me what happened. Well, I heard from every scientist in the free world about asbestos and the dangers of it and about uh, fiberglass, which we now put in the houses, which I... See, the question was the size and shape of the particles. And asbestos particles are exactly the same size and shape as the smaller particles from fiberglass insulation. So maybe someday we'll be tearing out the fiberglass insulation from our houses. I noticed Dr. Selikoff, who was a principal witness then 17 years ago, is now talking about that. I had asked questions about it at the time. But um, the Every time I would make a move, the Court of Appeals would reverse me or give a continuance. The mining company was saving $144 a second for every hour that that case was continued in court. And sometimes the, the Court of Appeals, uh, sitting in St. Louis, not all of them, but some of them, would vote to... Uh, delay the case for three months. Can you imagine how many dollars that meant into the pockets of the companies? Then they made studies. Like Every time you make a study, I'm watching the studies on Northwest Airlines now. They make a study on cost-benefit analysis. And they can project 3,000 jobs that then go to the grocery store and to the hardware store, and to the gasoline station, and then from the, those people all go to their grocery store. And they can make that into a billion dollar proposition, two or 3,000 jobs. In the Reserve Mining Company case, they 
projected the loss of uh, economic loss if that plant closed, it was almost enough to stagger state government and make it impossible for state government to continue. A few years later, when they saw it to their advantage, the mining companies saw it to their advantage, to close the mine to prevent people from suing them for the asbestos that they had spread around. See, uh, the mine closed, and we never, you never heard much about it. You didn't hear that the state government was, that the farmers in southern Minnesota would have to now pay the taxes. There was no, it was nothing. So most of these economic studies are phony, and I, I don't believe in the ones that Reserve Mining Company put out, and I don't believe the ones that they're putting out on Northwest Airlines. In that case, you were accused of gross bias against the company, and you were removed from the case. Yeah. What did you do? Well, I just told the truth. You see, what happened was that I began to understand that poisoning the air was almost worse than poisoning the water. Uh, there was a lot of talk about whether or not these small fibers are small as a molecule of water, smaller than a virus, whether they would penetrate through your gut wall and so forth and hurt you. But there was no doubt that in the lungs they would kill you. I had the people from some of the experts, one of them was from Mayo Clinic, two of them were from Mayo Clinic. We took air samples over the schoolhouse and the playgrounds and the churches. We came back and listened to what they found, very little bit of airborne asbestos. Then I took a look and they had, by their so-called random selection, they had selected two rainy days and one snowy day to find out how to report on. When I saw that and began to appreciate what was happening, I called a meeting of the lawyers and said, get me the reports of the airborne asbestos on sunny, shiny days and windy days. I never got those reports. I got kicked out of the case first. What had you done to get you kicked out? I had called for the evidence that would sink them. The rest of it was just playing around. I had to, one of the things that a judge has to do is, is listen forever. To no matter how much foolishness they bring into a case, the judge is supposed to listen to it and sit there and pretend he, it's very important, even though it's not important. But you can't rule it's not important till you see it. So uh, when I finally got to the place where I could really see what the danger was, I was removed from the case. And so I was, and I was very critical of the mining company. They'd hid all the records of how they could, the theory was, could we get them out of the lake and on land and dispose it on land instead of dump it into the Duluth drinking water and poison Lake Superior, which contained one-fourth, about 20 or 25 percent of the world's fresh water. I didn't like that. And they had to have it in the lake because that was the easiest place. So um, when I started getting tough with them, and I started reprimanding them for hiding documents. I didn't have any faith at all in them. But the fact is they delayed as long as they could. I was maybe 22 months or so trying that case. And if a lawyer got up and said, Your Honor, uh, I don't like this evidence. I object to it because it's uh, illegal, immoral, and fattening he could save that company about $500 just by saying that. If you divide the amount of interest, they would have had to pay, had they borrowed the money to go on land, you know, half a billion dollars or so, it would run to $144 a second. It's a rough one. Maybe it was 200 When that happened and you got taken off the case because of what, they, what the court called gross bias, did you already have a reputation by then of being an opinionated, aggressive judge? Or was that the beginning of your reputation? I had, I had the impression of being a judge who, when he made up his mind, meant it. 
I don't think there's any use being a judge if you don't decide anything. Too many judges, and some who may be watching this, I just tell them a message. If you got on that job to be a judge, then judge. When somebody's right, tell them they're right. When somebody's wrong, tell them they're wrong. But aren't you supposed to do that at the end of the process of the trial, not in the well, midst or how during? How many months do you go on before you start to learn you're being hoodwinked? Everything I said was based on the record and uh, all validated. The judge who took over after me fined them two or three million dollars for delay of game, for just wasting time. So I was vindicated, vindicated. Let's talk I about thought I was, anyway. I didn't need, think I needed vindication. I was right to start with. If somebody else disagreed, that's their business. And what the reasons are for disagreeing was also their business. Let's talk about another instance when you were vindicated after uh, being accused of behavior that was inappropriate in the court's eyes, and that's with uh, the uh, a. H. Robbins Company and the Dalcon Shield case. It was inappropriate in the eyes of the people who I called in to reprimand. You called in executives from A. H. Robbins in the midst of a trial. Yeah, I called in three of them. Told them they ought to have a heart and start planting, stop planting time bombs in the wombs of America's womanhood. Three hundred thousand women made claims. And as I said in that speech, if one rapist had come to a woman, sneaked up on her when she was sleeping, and imposed that kind of damage on her body, he'd go to jail for 20 years. These people dressed in their white uh, pharmaceutical robes, so-called ethical drug manufacturers, knew what was happening, and they did it to 300,000 women. Now, they, put, they kept selling an IUD, which yeah, they knew was dangerous. Selling the Dalcon Shield, which when they put it up in the womb, had a little twine string-like thing that would wick the germs. There's supposed to be a germ-free area in the womb, bacteria-free. They'd suck it up there, and then women get terribly sick, and they'd have hysterectomies or babies born with the Dalcon Shield sticking out of their head and a little teeny round thing about like that, you know. And they were pulling a wool over the judges in 10,000 cases that were pending. They'd disqualify a judge. They'd lie and cheat and steal. And those lawyers that they had would try the cases where they had some rum dum as a lawyer on it for the plaintiff, and then they'd win. And they'd win. They wouldn't pay them a dime. The person would be forced to trial. Then they'd win. And then they would equate that with a case where some good lawyer had beaten them and you couldn't really foreclose them. So I figured uh, that, that maybe the way to do was just to expose them once and for all. And I did that. Tell me what it was like for you to be the subject of a judicial inquiry because you were brought to trial in a sense yourself because of your conduct in the A.H. Robbins case. Well, they hired Griffin Bell. A former a. H. Robbins did. Job. Yeah. And uh, he's the same guy who went, to, he wrote a report for Hutton. He went to the E.F. Hutton Company. Remember, they were supposed to have cheated a lot of banks. He said to him, I'll look into this and I'll write a report. If you don't like to report, uh, we'll just bury it or you pay me less or something. So he wrote a report and said everything Hutton did was okay. He hired out to, to uh, try and reprimand me. They didn't succeed, you know. They, um, they, what the most they said was that I should have given the people more notice before I reprimanded them. And I actually had given them more notice, but the lawyers I gave it to lied that they had, they didn't know that I was going to call the people in and ball them out. Well, the charges of misconduct were dropped, yeah. but your speech to the executives yeah. was stricken from the yeah. record. And they told me it was published in 17 languages, <laughs> that same speech. So they dropped it from the record of the law books, which, but. Uh, People can find it if they need yeah. it. Mm -hmm. 
But how did you feel being yourself, in a sense, on trial, a judge? I, um, I wasn't frightened. I wasn't intimidated. I was rather angry and resentful. Uh, after you do the best you can and do exactly what you think is right, and having had enough experience as an attorney general, a U.S. district attorney, and a judge for all those years, I have some semblance of what was right. When I get a man who had never practiced law on the Court of Appeals to start telling me how to run it, I, I, um, I had about that much respect for it. Are you afraid of dying? Not particularly. You know, I like to live. I have two little twin granddaughters. I was driving along with one of them in the car. They're only six months old and just starting to crawl. They both crawled to me this morning. I was so happy when I went by. But I just thought, well, kid, I'll never see you graduate from high school. You know, I'd be very lucky if I did. I'm uh, 70, plus 18, I'll be 88. And I, I won't, yeah, well, there's some, but I won't remember where I am probably if I go there anyway, so what's the difference? You might for a moment. Yeah. Let's see, what are all those funny little black hats? So how long have you been married to Maxine? 51 years. So what's the secret success of a good marriage? Well, first of all, you have to marry a wonderful person. That, you know, the one that just, at every turn, Maxine pleases me. Uh, I don't know that there's any secret to it. Uh, I think one secret to it is to make a determination that's going to last. Because any family that tells you they never had any trouble is not telling the truth. And with either with their kids or with each other. I mean, we've had our moments, we've had our disagreements, but I never thought that just because we have a disagreement we should run off and see a lawyer, you know. Tell me, do you have faith in the American judicial system these days? I had a lot more faith before they started putting on too many right-wingers. I was thinking on the way over here that I'd call Paul Wellstone and tell him, Paul, don't ever be found with the ink on your fingers or the blood on your hands or however you want to describe it that says you voted for this man Thomas. Regardless of his color, it doesn't make a darn bit of difference. I would not, if I had been in the Senate, I wouldn't have voted. I'd have come right down the line. I would have voted for Blackman, and not one of the other Republicans they put on that bench since. It's going to change our world. It's going to change the way we deal with each other. It's going to uh, undermine the hopes and aspirations of poor people and minorities all over not only America but this world. Can you imagine what it's like in a country where people have no concept, they hardly know what makes babies and no way of having love and a marriage relationship and a man and woman relationship without having them just bing, 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 bing like that. And then they starve. And our country as official policy says that must go on. And then when they rise up in their teeming millions and they look to us with hatred and jealousy and expect us to support them, and we can't do it. Everybody that's thinking about it says that the population, world population, we're not going to be able to support it on the face of this earth. And yet, because of a few conservative people, and they're not all conservative, some of them are so-called liberals, but their religious outlook forces them to overpopulate the world. I think that's crazy. It's wild. It's stupid. And those are important. Those are important things. If I had made a decision, if you ask me what an important decision was, if I had made a decision that everybody would have access to birth control devices, uh, safe pills or whatever it would be, 
That would be the most important decision I ever could make. Miles Lord, thank you for being with us on Portrait. All right. Funding for this TPT archival podcast was made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.